Um, so my name is David Weston. I, I'm, I was a teacher for nine years. I taught maths and physics. I was a data manager. Um, and uh, I last year end, um, sort of took a break from teaching, set up the Teach Development Trust. So the Trust is the uh, national charity, whole of the UK, um, uh, for effective professional development. And so we're really interested in how do teachers improve what they do so that learners um, have better outcomes and it's based on the evidence of what really works. So we need to un unpack a lot of that and, and, and what, what, what works means. First of all, I want to point out this irony here, um, which really someone should have pointed out right at the beginning of the day, that actually there's kind of an implicit assumption that if teachers are more versed in research, that actually things will improve, but actually there really is no research that, would, that, that can show us that. So the evidence for evidence is very thin, which I think is um, a little bit odd um, that no one else has mentioned that today. There is just we're just assuming if more people know stuff, things will get better. It's entirely possible if we te teach teachers more things, they'll get more and more confused, make more and more wrong judgments, and things will get worse. But we'll see. So I want to talk about how do we choose what works? How do we reject? Um, why do people reject some of those things about what works? Um, how do we then implement some of these things about what works? Um, and then generally a few ideas about the system. So, um, I want to pick on this particular, uh, this particular idea, which was teaching assistants. Telegraph, 2011. Teaching assistants, useless. Okay, that's effectively what they said. Now, this came from uh, a piece of research in the Sutton Trust, um, where they basically said, um, look, overall, the overall effectiveness of teaching assistance is zero. Now, when you actually unpack what un underneath what they actually said, was they basically found lots of different studies, and I don't know if this is how the effectiveness was actually arranged, but it's just as an example. And effectively, what they found was there were some cases where, oh, I can't do that, can I? Some cases where people used teaching assistance where it was negative and actually it caused a problem and it harmed the education of pupils. In other cases, over here, they found there were situations where it, it improved the education of the pupils and they made more progress and so on. Um, and then they said, okay, overall on average, therefore zero teaching assistants don't work, they don't make a difference. Now clearly you can see from that that actually there's a very complicated story about teaching assistants, which as soon as you unpack the information, is actually very, very interesting. And it turns out, on this side over here, you have teaching assistants isolating a pupil in a corner, doing all their work for them, uh, stopping the teacher from giving them explanations, giving them lower quality explanations. Whereas on this side, you had teaching assistants who were adding value to those uh, the teachers who are in the classroom, and they were going and adding extra challenge and, and supporting the teacher in a way that was really effective. But we don't get that from teaching assistants, effect size zero. Um, now, what we need to do is not just look at what's the average effect size of something and, and is what's the average effectiveness of something, but we really need to think about when we're choosing what works is actually saying, recognising that every summary of the research out there is actually based on a huge number of studies. Um, so again, I've picked two things from this Sutton Trust toolkit, which is now owned by the Education Endowment Foundation. And basically what they're talking about is there is a range of research, for example, that smaller class sizes um, effectively on average are a kind of zero effectiveness. Um, sometimes it made things worse, sometimes it made things better. Whereas learning to learn strategies, metacognition, do you understand how you're learning? Those things, most of the studies were positive. So pretty much if you're going to choose whether you're going to do smaller class sizes or learning to learn, well, you have no idea how it's going to work in your school. But hey, let's, well, let's play the probabilities here. Let's pick something that uh, looks like um, it's worked in more places elsewhere. But that's all you can say. We don't actually know whether in, in our school, learning to learn might actually, we might have an implementation here. So actually saying what works, well, it's a bit daft saying what works, because we don't know. We don't know how it's going to work in our school until we actually try it. So this is the problem. To simplify things for practitioners, people say, in this context, researchers want to say in this context this was effective. But to try and simplify for teachers, we end up saying this is effective, do it. And that's the problem because actually if a teacher just listens to that, then actually they won't know the complexity of what's underneath it. Um, now, then of course we can say well, what does effective actually mean? And people have talked about this quite a lot today, so I shall not spend long. Um, in the medical world, uh, there's not too much controversy. We don't want to kill people. Okay, so if something ends up killing people more, it's probably bad. If it kills people less, it's probably better. 
In education, though, then of course, as, well, as soon as one person says, ah, oh, this improved my uh, maths results, that's great, but someone else will say, ah, oh, yeah, the fact that they actually get better at maths or the results better. You know, what does an exam actually mean? Does it really help you in life? Maybe we should be looking at actual learning, and then someone else will say, well, what's learning? And how do you measure it? And, you know, you say learning, but I think we should, in fact, have progress, because it's all about not just what they've learned and absolute attainment, but progress. And someone else says, but that doesn't matter, because actually it's all about what knowledge, and what knowledge they have at the end. And then someone else says, no, forget knowledge, it's all about skills. And then someone else will say, I don't really mind, I just want citizens with lots of well-being and maybe engaged in their studies. And they'll all argue with each other, and if you have a study that comes out and says, this improves exam results, all hell is set loose, because suddenly everyone's going, well, I don't believe that's the actual outcome for education. So we don't have this luxury the medics have of, did they die or not? We have every single study, we have to say, well, okay, is this actually the outcome we're interested in to start with? Now, John Hattie, who's also been... Uh, mentioned many times today, of course, synthesized thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of quantitative studies, and he sort of said, right, I need to find some way to compare the effectiveness of this to the effectiveness of this. And he decided to settle on this, this thing called effect size. And he said, right, this is a, a language I'm going to adopt, and we're going to have big effect sizes up here, and it will surprise very few people from after today to see that feedback is right at the top, and if you feedback better to students, they will improve, and then right at the bottom, then actually things like team teaching um, actually make very, very little difference, and actually doesn't really help. And John Hattie synthesised all of this and thought, well, that's quite interesting. Now, the trouble with effect size is it's now a currency. We're all going, effect size, effect size, what's the effect size of this? What actually is it? To demystify it, it's literally this. Let's say, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's say, um, uh, maybe slightly simplified results. Okay, so we had, um, before the teacher did something, this was the, the set of scores that they got. After the teacher did something, this was the scores that they got. Scores were quite spread out. Everyone went up by exactly 10 points. That's great. Um, the average went from 30 to 40. They were pretty spread out. So actually, this 20 here would still have been fairly low here, and this 50 here, even after the intervention, would still be fairly high here. So it's quite effective. Effect size 0.63, we just do the average of the, that minus the average of that divided by how spread out the scores were. Okay, and there are some complications around that. Another set of results. This time, the students got 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and they changed to 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. Everyone went up by exactly the same amount. That teacher changed those scores by exactly the same amount. The difference in this case was that the lowest score here was now much higher than the highest score over here. So you could say, on the one hand, well, that sounds much more effective because the scores which are all over here have now all moved to here, rather than scores that were here moving to scores that were here. So this shows an effectiveness that's much bigger. But of course, it depends. It depends, well, what do we know about the class? You know, maybe it was just by random occurrence they all happened to be close together beforehand. We don't know. So actually, one of the issues we've got here is that even though that appears to be a lot more effective, this, how spread out the results were, is massively influential on effect size. So if you've got, um, if you've got a school where you do math setting, for example, then if you take the middle set, which are all going to have scores quite close together, that's going to have a very small standard deviation of their scores. So the effect size is going to appear much bigger. So therefore, anything where you've got setting, is going to appear more effective than when you've got mixed results because their standard deviation was much bigger. So just that simple little formula here, that causes big problems. So actually effect size, we've got to be very careful about that when we start adopting and saying what does it mean because actually every single study back in Hattie's table here, we need to go back and say, well, wait a minute, were they mixed or were they set? In fact, were they even using the same measures? In fact, what methodology did you use? You can't just go up effect size and then gloss over everything else. Another problem, Hattie said, look, I looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of things, some of which are here, and pretty much everything I looked at, nearly everything I looked at had a positive effect. Pretty much you change anything in the school, everyone's a bit happy about it, they've done something new, they're thrilled, they're motivated. On average, everything has a positive effect, pretty much. So he said, look, 
There's, it, why, if, you're, if you put all these things in the table, why bother with the lower half of the table? What's the point? Well, you might as well spend just as much time implementing something in the top half of the table that appears to be more effective. So according to Hattie, he said, look, let's draw a line with effect size of 0.4. Everything below that, you could do it, it's probably going to help, but there are other things you can spend your time doing that are more effective. Okay? So Hattie said, this is called his hinge point. I have a problem with that as well. If you do studies that show how much reading scores change, or even how much mathematics scores change, or even how much science scores change from year to year, then these are the effects of one year of teaching. So the effect of one year of teaching going from year one to year two is an effect size of 1.52. Might be because all the kids start with very similar scores together. Could be all sorts of reasons. By the time we reach five, uh, years five and six, and actually one year of teaching has an effect size of 0.4. By the time we reach years 12 to 13, one year of teaching only has an effect size of 0.06. Now, if we take Hattie's 0.4, if you apply something with a 0.4 to this, then actually 0.4 isn't very much, it's only about a quarter of the progress they make. Here, 0.4 is a whole year's worth of progress, so you, know, you don't necessarily want to get rid of things that are 0.4. Here, 0.4 is spectacularly seven times the progress they'd make in that year. So someone tells you to disregard something that's less than 0.4 and you're looking at things in the sixth form, you should go, well, I'm not sure I should actually. And so suddenly all those things people go, oh no, no, the effect size is too small. Again, well, but what year are we looking at? And how, how, how spread out were, were the results? In fact, does that effect size really tell us anything? Maybe we need to go back and look at the original results. So the problem is, can any practitioner generally really understand the methodology that's going on? You know, should, do, should we really have to go back and ask about the original cohort characteristics and what the evaluation methods were? Now, of course, we can't do that. You know, we could be pragmatic here and say, look, we want practitioners to actually understand how to do things better. So, what we need to do is summarise things. And, and the trouble is, these summaries, like Hattie's summary or the Education Endowment Foundation, then they simplify. This is the Education Endowment Foundation's toolkit in graphical form. It's great, actually, I love this. Um, they basically said, this is how expensive it is, and here's how effective it is. But they summarised lots of things, and they used effect sizes. And in almost all those cases, apart from homework, it assumes that it is just as effective at early years foundation stage with little ones as it is in the sixth form. But we don't know if all the studies were done down that end or up that end of the scale. We just don't know. So this might be a vague guide, but really it doesn't tell you much about what's going to happen in your school. Um, I mean, the only thing that really consistently comes out is no matter, no matter what year group you're looking at, no matter how young or how old, feedback is always a good thing. Feedback really helps learning. Um, so, a question to you. We try, this is, the first part is trying to find out what works. Is it actually dangerous to give, to give practitioners these very superficial summaries of research? Um, and actually, shouldn't we try and get practitioners to engage with the original research in some way? At the minute, we've said practitioners are over here, researchers are over here. We're just going to take what happens with the researchers and just kind of move it right over here, simplify it lots and lots. We're not going to expect the practitioners to engage at all. Just here are some numbers, get on with it. Maybe the practitioners, the teachers, the lecturers, maybe they need to just move a little bit as well. We need to help the teachers actually understand a bit more about the research so that they're not just being sold numbers and effect sizes and this works, do it. Because otherwise, I don't see how we're going to engage with this. Um, so, uh, I've said that. Right, so let's say, right, we've chosen what works. For, for right or wrong reasons, we've now chosen, I know what I'm going to do. So, why is it when somebody stands up and says synthetic phonics works, which is the classic case, or um, project based learning works, why don't people listen to that? There are unfortunately lots and lots of reasons. Um, so, first of all, uh, for evolutionary reasons, you'll love my cartoons here, they've been drawn with great care. Um, so, um, for evolutionary reasons, every single time we go into any room, any social occasion, we are judging our status of everybody, our social status against everybody else. And we are trained in order to make sure that, for example, we're not going to end up losing out on mating partners or we're not going to end up getting in a fight, to be very aware of who's kind of the top dog in the room. Or, um, and we are therefore quite fearful if anyone is about to put us down and say, oh, you're, I'm, I'm better than you, you're worse than me. 
We're quite fearful of that. It causes a big stress, uh, stress reaction. So as soon as somebody comes to you and says, oh, yeah, no, actually, believe it, I know a lot better than you. I've been doing this a lot better than you. In fact, you're quite inferior the way you've been doing this. You're going to get really stressed. And your action is going to want to be either fight or flight. So you're either going to ignore them or you're going to attack them. Um, the other thing, of course, for evolutionary reasons, we need to know, are we, sit, are we with the people in our pack or not? So relatedness to those people around us is really important. Again, if we find people who we don't feel we relate to, they appear to be other than us, we get really stressed. We probably either want to fight them or run away from them. So actually, if some person who just doesn't feel like you is coming and telling you things, then actually just go, I, I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're similar, I'm not sure we share the same values, I'm not sure you're from around here, are you? You probably don't understand. <laughs> um, Timeliness, this is another classic one, saying, you know, I'm sat here, I don't have year 11s this year, but actually now I've moved on and now I'm taking them in the lower sixth. And uh, someone says, oh, you should have used this with the year 11s. Well, that's great, thanks. <laughs> really enjoying sitting through this session. Um, uh, and then another problem, and oh, wow, I've seen this a lot today, um, <laughs> language. So, um, sad but true, practitioners and researchers speak completely different language. You know, this is totally reasonable language to many researchers, and they'll quite happily spout it off, and teachers go, what? And actually, teachers will then fill, come back with a jargon fill, more acronyms than you can shake a stick at, the researchers, and they'll probably go, what? and they don't speak the same language, and it's actually been documented very well that this is one of the biggest problems of teachers actually saying, I'd like to read this research paper, but it's in these sort of alienese, it's in academic academies. I, I don't even understand what's going on. Another problem we've talked about, superficiality, Dylan Williams' assessment for learning. Poor Dylan Williams came out with one of the most brilliant pieces of research education ever seen inside the black box. Superb research, and what happened was he worked with a school, they had researchers in the school, and these people gradually tried out and adopted these approaches, formative assessment, formative feedback, and then he said, look, this really works, we've tested it really thoroughly. Here's a book, do this. Everyone was like, I can't be to read the book, or I kind of read it once at PGC. What's that all about again? Oh, don't worry, that was the thing where you write the objectives on the board? Oh yeah, okay, fine. And AFL went from being a huge study, which was a year long, to write your objectives on the board, and in superficiality, lost all of its effectiveness. In fact, it became damaging, as many of us who have been classroom practitioners bear the bitter scars. Um, context. Okay, so um, <laughs> you really need to trust the person. And this is to do with relatedness, okay? Because the, 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 the phrase here is, it's not going to work here. They don't work with kids like mine, you know, or, oh, yeah, goodness, yes, that might work in that inner city school. It's not going to work with our sort of children here. Um, it's a real problem. Context is king, and we discovered before with effect size. You really got to understand that. And those people will just say, no, forget that, that's from that other school. Of course it would work there, everything works there, they've got loads of money. They're outstanding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, then, of course, there's ideology. Um, ideology. Um, now, uh, you know, hesitate to mention any, say, say, say people in government or be people in opposition or anywhere else. But um, say someone comes and says, wow, I've done this great study on project-based learning. It's got an effect size of plus 0.73. Super. And, um, you know, okay, we happen to know this person who always loves project-based learning. But nevertheless, okay, well, our methodology sounded quite good. Of course, traditional teacher with a blog that says project-based learning is terrible, they're going to go, yeah. Yeah, of course, I, don't, I mean, A, totally against my values. And frankly, I'm going to lose quite a, lot, quite a lot of face if that's true. So I'm going to say that's not true. And let's find lots of reasons it's not true. And frankly, of course, they're going to say that because look who they are. And the research <laughs> is going to go, research, who needs it? It's all common sense. I feel what the children need. And this person is going to say, I tried that once, didn't work. For all these different reasons, they're all going to reject it. So we've got lots of reasons. There are still more. Um, culture, of course, you go into another school and someone says, here's a research paper. Here and someone says, oh, we don't do that here. No, sorry, no, we just, you know, we don't change the way we do things here. We don't jump on trains, you know, we don't jump on these sorts of things. Don't jump on bandwagons, it's all about doing the same thing with all this stuff. So it could be a cultural issue, or of course, teachers are busy, they are stressed, they're insecure, you know. You can't try this here because then you're going to look at me more carefully, you might try and video me, I don't want to go away. There are so many barriers to why people might not accept research. And the amazing thing, I think, is how much they're value-driven and emotion-driven. And we really forget that, and I don't think that's been mentioned anywhere near enough today, of how much values and emotion drive the acceptance 
of why they were going to do research or not. So actually, we can have all the research journals and research clubs, and you know, first rule of a journal club is to talk about journal club and all that sort of thing. Not going to happen unless people have buy-in. So then how do we actually implement it? Well, don't do all the things I've just said and try and avoid it. Um, now, CPD, uh, of course I'm going to talk about CPD. The Teacher Development Trust is the national charity for effective professional development of teachers. And unfortunately, when I started uh, the trust, I started it because I was shocked. Um, having been a teacher for nine years, I kind of read some things and thought, that's actually really shocking, but sadly it really chimes with what I've, just, what I've been having myself. And in a survey um, carried out by, um, for, the, for the TDA, obviously not, no longer exists, they said, right, we're going to look at, I think, about 100 different CPD experiences, and we're going to see which of those has the characteristics of something that will change practice. And 99 did not. One did. Nine of them had the characteristics of something that might kind of give you a really well embed a new idea if it was something you'd never had any experience with. 90 didn't even do that. A lot of them just told you some stuff, made you aware, you'd probably forget it. How are schools aware of this? Are they aware that when we go on CBD courses, it almost never, ultimately, has much effect on our learners? We feel it changes our practice. But actually, only 7% of schools ever actually say, so you've been, on, you've been learning about this this year, has it improved outcomes for your learners? And in fact, if you're in a secondary school, it's only 3%. That's pretty bad. And actually, to be honest, I reckon if you went to some of those schools and said, so how do you check those outcomes? Or oh, we asked the teachers. So I think that's too high. Is that the truth? Um, so how do we make it better? We can't just do one-off courses, they don't work. We can't do send people leaflets, it doesn't work. We can't do public, sorry to the Education Foundation, we can't publish it on the website and assume people will make it work. They won't. So, first of all, you need to get by. You need to say to people, right, why are we going to choose what we're going to choose? You need to have some choice in this, it can't just be I am your leader, I am telling you. And it needs to be relevant to what we are all doing together. That's really important to find. Um, second thing is we need to have more evolution and less revolution. Um, it's really hard, given it's a values-driven process, to change suddenly from I believed in what I was doing, and of course everyone believes in what they're doing, you know, it was with teachers, to suddenly say I have to adopt something completely new. It's actually much easier to pilot things with some people who are keen already, and then let others learn from colleagues who they trust, who they have a relationship with, and say, okay, yeah, I can begin to see that happens, let's let it spread, let's let it evolve. If everyone is cynical, maybe you can take them to a school where these sorts of things are happening, they go, gosh, these people do, they seem to be a bit like me, and these kids are a bit like ours, and this is working, and gosh, that's really interesting. So evolution is really important. Inquiry is probably the most important thing that we can do, and that's not telling teachers, but letting them inquire and learn it and acquire the knowledge. So this is a process we use many part of our National Teacher Inquiry Network, of which there are members in the room. And um, essentially what we're saying to teachers is, look, here's a piece of research. You need to say, what is it you're going, what outcomes are you going to try and change? And then, in perhaps a triad, you're going to see what happens. Lesson by lesson, plan. Lesson by lesson, observe each other. See, discuss what happens and see, as you cycle through, what's happening. And the first time round, you try and implement these ideas, you'll probably find it doesn't work perfectly. So you'll go back to the research and you'll talk to the expert, and you will gradually build up through a process of trial and error and refinement, an understanding of what it is and the underlying theory. So, um, I'll skip past that, that's talking about lesson study. We can't tell people to do feedback. That's no good. How do, you how do you evaluate that someone is doing feedback apart from sitting in the back with a clipboard and saying, you did feedback, well done. Who knows if the feedback helps anyone? What we need to say is, right, okay, um, I want to improve reading of the quiet preschool meal, meal boys in year five. I've got a very specific cohort. I've got something very specific. We're going to do it by using feedback. Now I can tell if the quiet preschool meal boys in year five did improve their reading, because I can check before I started and after I started and see if I've really made a difference. Now that's professional development to improve learning. That's not just professional development to make me do different stuff. We need, we can't just say, did you find that was better? And how many people here have gone on a training course where at the end they said, did you enjoy the course? <laughs> Quite a lot of you, yes. Some of them, I'm telling that partly from hands and partly from laughter. 
Um, we can't just have subjective judgments, although they are important because of professionalism and understanding. If you don't have any subjective judgments, there's no reason for you to get better at judging. You need to have objective and subjective judgments. You need to have direct measures of the reading and indirect measures. Are you turning up to my lessons? Are you taking more books out of the library? We need to have quantitative measures, how many books are you taking out of the library, what score do you get on the reading test, and qualitative. I can describe the fluency which you have. And I'm talking, and let's describe the different sorts of books you're taking out. We need all of these things to evaluate what we're going to do. We need to have a leadership and culture where the head doesn't go, do feedback! Because that's a problem. Where the head actually says, right, tell you what, I know you're all a bit cynical, so I'm going to try and do some new feedback stuff with the quiet year five boys and around reading, and you can come and watch me do that and help me do it, and then once you're sure that I'm genuinely not doing it for performance management's sake, then I might ask you to do it as well. Um, we need head to... So I went to a school at some point in the past, in the past few months, and we do a little CPD audit when people join our network. And we said to the one particular head of the department, um, so to what extent is sort of innovation um, encouraged here? You know, how much people take risks? And he thought that and said, not at all. <laughs> um, really? He said, yeah, no, pretty much. I mean, with these drop-in inspections, we basically just do the safe thing now, you know, we don't really take risks. And my jaw dropped and my colleague's jaw dropped and we're like, oh, okay, right. Um, not great. Um, that was the head's fault. Of course, you know, right, we're making sure people are doing the right thing. Unfortunately, totally stifled any risk taking. Um, some schools systematise research, some schools have general clubs, some schools have inquiry that goes on. They do exist. School up north, Pamlington Learning Village, wow, love it. Um, they spend two hours a week, every single week, where they plan lessons together and they look at research together. Roxham Teaching School in Potters Bar, primary school, amazing. They're all doing master's research in some sort, they're all doing lesson study, and they're looking at research all the time. Relationships. It's got to be about relationships. Understanding research is a social and interactive process. It's not about reading stuff. So, if academics really want to help this process happen, then two things need to happen. First of all, academics need to spend more time in schools, and teachers need to spend more time with the academics. There must be more time for them to engage together. And I'm not talking about teachers, we're doing our own thing, come in and give us some consultancy, or, okay, look, we're academics, you can come and do a master's if you like, and that's it. That's not the model that works. It needs to be coming together and actually doing these processes together. I'm going to slightly disagree with Chris Husbands when earlier he said, I don't believe practitioner research can lead to something that will change the evidence base. Because I think practitioner research can show there's a feasible idea that said, look, it was a very small scale study, but it seemed to work. Can we work with these five other schools and your, your university, and can we try scaling it up? And then can we work with another hundred schools and then scale it up? So I disagree with Chris on that. Um, everybody has to work together. And of course, the more that happens, the more the language will begin to move together. And of course, the more that will enable us, people will go, gosh, we really need to find a way where we have a researcher in residence in the school. And every university department will say, actually, we need a lot of our academics who do still spend time in school. You don't find medical researchers who say, who proudly say, oh, I haven't taught for 20 years. They've all, they're all saying, oh yes, I performed this bit of surgery last week. And when they stop doing the surgery, usually they stop publishing. You know, it, it's a it's a course. You of course you're practicing at the same time as researching. And again, I don't want to go down that medics do it best because there are plenty of problems. But I think we can learn something from that. Um, we need challenge. I don't know if you can see this, but um, and we're all firmly opposed to any form of groupthink. Right, JV. Right, JV. Right, JV. <laughs> the whole idea. Groupthink's really easy. Don't. If any school thinks I'm going to do all this inquiry stuff, we're going to do it by ourselves and not get anyone externally, you make a mistake because you're all going to start agreeing with each other at some point, and you might all be wrong. Um, you need time and resources, we've talked about that already. Um, and then the final thing, which you have to frankly have spent a whole hour talking about, if I won't promise, is I have to take this research over here. I have to make it work in my context. I might have to tweak a few bits and change a few things and make it work because for our kids, they have different needs. But we always have to have someone going, yeah, but with the original research, when it actually worked, that's not what happened. There is never going to be an easy answer to this, and you can't change everything, and you can't change nothing. You need to adapt it just enough, but not too much. There needs to be a constant tension, and some schools are going to go too far in contextualising it and lose the effectiveness, and some researchers are going to go too far in refusing to let people change, and it will be also be ineffective. 
Um, so, so we've got to scale things up. I've had a brilliant idea, let's do inquiry and see if it suddenly materialises as something huge. And we're going to take the big ideas there and we're going to scale them down to make them work in our classrooms. So, finally, what do I think? How can we actually improve the system? Um, I'm going to zoom through these because I want to get the questions. Aspirations, I think, first of all, everyone in the system needs to want to say, I want to engage more with research, because not everybody does. So how do we do that? Well, I think we need to get lots of well-respected people saying this is a good thing to do, make sure our arguments are good, probably find some research that this is actually going to help improve education, that would be helpful. Um, and engage the sceptics head on and actually do something about that. Secondly, once people are aspiring to do this, then they need to expect that it will happen. Because it can't just be, yeah, we hope it will happen one day, but of course it's going to happen, it's going to happen every day. It needs to be worked into everyday standards, into everyday policy, into classroom observation, into discussion, into professional standards, into everything we do. We should just, as a matter of course, expect, of course, you will engage with research. I will put these online somewhere, so apologies. Um, expectations, uh, yeah, I've just done that. Um, capacity and focus. Um, we need to make sure teachers actually have the capacity to change. Everything that I've said requires time, it requires money, it requires investment. If we're going to say this is important and we need to prioritise this more than other things, then this is going to be the tough one. We can't just say this is important too. Because schools have a hundred important things, and nobody, if anyone says, I think this is slightly less important, there is an, up, uh, there is an, an outcry, an uproar in the media. As soon as the government says, you, you've got a hundred things that are important, we're only going to reduce it to ten, ninety stakeholder groups say, how outrageous that you said these things are less important, of course they're not. I'm afraid we have to, if we want to make any of them effective, we have to decide which is less important. We can't say everything is more important than everything else. Finally, what are we doing about it? The Teach Development Trust. First of all, we are saying, right, look, there are experts out there, some are good, some are bad. We run a national database of professional development called Good CPD Guide, and um, covers the whole of the UK, mainly folks in England at the moment who are expanding that, and it's got links to the Southern Trust Toolkit, so when someone says, I want to improve feedback, we can help them say, yeah, you should speak to someone about that, here's who. Um, we try and encourage quality. We're the only country in the world where anybody off the street can say, oh, I'm a teacher trainer now, this person loves me. And head teachers just have to know. So we're trying to fight, even though we have no big stick to beat people with, we're not the government, we're trying to improve codes of practice, teacher reviews, all those sorts of things. Um, and then I've already mentioned our National Teacher Inquiry Network. Lots of other people have said, we need an information architecture. I'm going to say, we've got an information architecture. What are we doing? Any school who joins us, basically, what are they getting? They're getting an understanding of their culture and the leadership in their school and the way they carry these things out. We're then giving them detailed tools on how to access research, how to implement things, how to do micro-inquiry, how to evaluate it, and, uh, and then we're helping the schools talk to each other. So I'm going to say, we are an information architecture. In fact, Ben Goldacre at our launch said, this is an information architecture, and I thought he was great, even though I hadn't paid him to say that, so that was great. Um, I hadn't paid him at all, in fact. Um, so that's what we're doing about it. That's all I'm going to say, because we're nearly the end of the session. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. Um, please feel free to get in touch. Any questions? Any thoughts, criticisms? Disagree with me? Anything? Yeah? Um, more question on the process. Do you find that there's any kind of certain type of teacher who's more likely to get involved in using research or joining an inquiry network? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it's perfectly reasonable if somebody, some people are more interested in some things and some people are more cynical than others generally, you know, kind of a classic bell curve situation, you've got a few percent of people joining with everything and you've all met some of those, and then the next few will just, just, you know, join with some things, the majority of people kind of just get on with stuff, and then there are the people, few people at this end who are just utterly resistant. Definitely. You need to start with the ones who are going to give it a go, and then assuming everyone doesn't think they're complete freaks, then learn from them and begin to spread the practice across. But yeah, you, it depends. If someone goes, inquiry, I always want to do inquiry, but of course the person who gets up every day wanting to do creative art is going to go, but I want to do creative art. So it depends what people want. But yes. Yeah? Um, I went from working in university back into school this year, last year, I <laughs> just finished my first year. Um, and one of the reasons I did that was because of the level of frustration in higher education where I felt that it was almost impossible to connect with schools, and partly because of the pressures you're under as a researcher for the funding mechanisms within universities to publish. So the only way you can win funding for your research department
department in the universities to publish in the highest regard, regard, sorry, the most highly regarded international academic journals. Yeah. And to get into those, you have to write at such a complex, opaque level. Yeah. Um, and also, they're then barred unless unless teachers have Athens or Shibboleth, um, you know, access to those journals. They never get to read them. Yeah. So there's this huge problem there, I think, between the way that the universities are being organised, funded, and held to account, yeah. and what teachers actually need in schools in order yeah. to access that information. I agree. I think the government level has got a problem. The university sits in one department, schools sit in another department. They're both saying, yeah, we'd like more interaction. Never going to happen unless they both sit within the same department. Mm -hmm. And of course, those are political battles. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, why, God, if we want schools to have access to research, then hey, give them access to the research. You know, that would be a really good start. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, why not? I and mean, if you want, if you want the universities to engage with schools, then why not make sure they're paid? They're not paid not to. You know, not paid to just go and do other stuff. Pretty simple things. I mean, I wasn't, in, I wasn't in Sam Friedman's speech earlier, but I hope he'd say something like that. I know there's problems, that's, but yeah, no, I agree. It's nice to hear people who've moved back and forth between the two, though, um, and, and have an understanding. So, um, anyone else? Any other comments? Uh, you talked a lot about, uh, well, take phonics as an example about yeah. how something which is believed clearly to be good yeah. gets rejected. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the remedies you had are local ones, and as a politician, I don't have access to them. I've either got a steamroller or money, yes. uh, and we'll use one or the other. I mean, are there, are there better ways for us? Uh, yeah, you need to create the local structures. I mean, the whole point is it, it won't possibly work, but you can't just have the central thing in a completely autonomous system and then just assume by saying something centrally, they will pick it up. I hope I've shown that it doesn't work that way. You have to create structures which will, and information architectures, as Ben said earlier, that permeate things out. It doesn't have to be the all-encompassing national strategies type, but it can be a much more a ground up, can we have the systems that make sure schools work together? And you know, teaching schools, great, that's a really good start. It needs to be more of it, it needs to be better funded, but I think that's great. Um, but I mean, your point about, yeah, the values, um, unfortunately, you know, synthetic phonics, most people will go, one of the best ways of learning how to read, synthetic phonics, fine. As soon as Michael Gove says it, now it's tainted. Oh dear, now of course it's a Govian plot, destroying the world, and it must be evil. Um, and that's a problem. Um, and, you know, and even though there are legitimate criticisms of some things around synthetic phonics, the values thing is a problem. So politicians have a problem, but I, I, I do think they need to create the architecture for the information to move around the system and not just say, you can't just incentivize with sticks.